Good morning, everyone. Today is Pentecost Sunday, the Feast of Pentecost, which comes seven weeks, approximately 50 days after Easter, and is the day that we remember the gift of the Holy Spirit on the disciples in the upper room in Acts 2. And, and it's considered to be the birth of the church when um, the, the message of the gospel was spread in tongues of other nations and the church was born as 3,000 were added that day in Acts as Peter preached the gospel. We're going to hear those readings in a little bit, and I'm going to teach a little bit about Pentecost and what the gift of the Holy Spirit might mean for us as we're coming out of a season of prayer, as we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but let, let's gather our hearts around that this morning and celebrate and worship together. Praise God for the gift of God's own self here with us. For those of you who have families and children at home, there is a resource available. It's on our website. I didn't put the links in the email. I forgot to do that. But if you go to our website in either the Sunday morning section or the um, family resources section, there are links to a coloring page about Pentecost, to a family devotional and activity sheets that your kids can do. If that's helpful for you, uh, you can access those. Let's gather our hearts together and worship together our good God this Pentecost Sunday.
Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Lord, thank you for your word that gives us words to speak when we do not know what to say. I am so grateful to you for the ways you have and continue to meet our needs. Thank you for, he for the healing of our body, mind, and spirit. I am so glad that you never give up on us. You meet us where we are and you walk with us to bring us closer to you and to shape us daily to be more like your son. I lift up to you our many needs. You know our needs and you are with us in our struggle. You know our hearts and yet you still love us. Please continue to guide our government leaders as they try to make decisions in the best interest of all people. This is not an easy time as we are apart from family and friends. Help us to stay connected to you and to others through the many ways that are available to us. Protect the sick and our frontline workers who continue to risk their lives to ensure that everyone else is safe. Protect the children in our community who do not feel safe in their homes. Protect those who are abused and may feel trapped. Bring the right people to them to protect them. Help us to know who near us may need food or a phone call or help. Let us be your hands and feet in new ways. Forgive us when we don't listen or do what you ask. Help us to love others as you love and forgive those around us and to see every person as you do. For we were all created in your image. Guide our steps, Father, and keep us in your arms. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 to 13. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, no one can say Jesus is Lord. There are different kinds of gifts, but they all are given to believers by the same Spirit. These, these are different ways to serve, but they all come from the same Lord. These are different ways the Spirit works, this, but the same God is working in all these ways and in all people. The Holy Spirit is given to each of us in a special way that is for the good of all. To some people, the Spirit gives a message of wisdom. To others, the same Spirit gives a message of knowledge. To others, the same Spirit gives faith to others that one spirit gives gifts of healing to others he gives the power to do miracles miracles to others he gives the ability to prophesy, prophesy. to others he gives the ability to tell the spirit apart to others he gives a the ability to speak in different kinds of languages they have had not not known before and still others have gifts that the ability to explain what was said in those languages all of the gifts are produced produced by one and the same spirit he gives gifts to each person just as he decides. There 
is one body, but it has many parts. But all is many parts make up one body. It is still the it it is the same with church. Christ. Christ. We were we were all blessed. Baptized. baptized by one Holy Spirit, and so we are formed into one body. It doesn't uh, doesn't matter what whatever whether. whether we were Jews, Jews. or Gentiles, Gentiles, sa- slaves. slaves or free people. We were all given the same spirit or drink to drink bless the lord my soul
This is John 14, 15, and 16. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you, will, you also will live. Then I am raised to life again. You will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. Because they love me, the Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. But I will send you an advocate, the Spirit of Truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me, and you must also testify about me, because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he'll convict the world of its sin, and of God's righteousness, and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is avail available because I go in the Father, and you will see no more. Judgment will come, because the ruler of this world has already been judged. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of the truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said, the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. Acts 2, 1-21 when the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard, one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on, and kept saying, Aren't these all Galileans? How come we hear them talking in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, and Alamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phry Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make a head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? Others joked, they're drunk on cheap wine. That's when Peter stood up, backed by the other eleven, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, Listen carefully and get the story straight. These people aren't drunk as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions, your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both. And I'll prophesy, I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sky, the sun turning black and the moon blood red, before the day the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God will be saved. Happy Pentecost Sunday, everyone. The word Pentecost comes from the Greek word Pentecoste, which literally means 50th. It's rooted in the Jewish tradition of the, the festivals that God gave them. And so the first festival 
um, that's connected with this is the festival of unleavened bread of which Passover is the main day and that was the festival that commemorated their exodus from Egypt when God rescued them out of Egypt. It's the central story for the people of Israel and and part of that story then is that God gave them the law. So the festival of unleavened bread and Passover is when they're, they're led out of Egypt in that incredible moment. And then they journey and eventually make their way to Sinai. And the festival that commemorates that is called the Festival of Weeks. And the Festival of Weeks is when they remember the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And the Festival of Weeks takes place 50 days after Passover. 49 days, 7 weeks, plus 1 day. And that's the instruction that's given in the Old Testament. And in the Festival of Weeks, it also coincides with harvest time. And so it was a festival of first fruits. And it was one of their major festivals that was considered a pilgrimage festival because they were to bring their offerings of their first fruits, their tithes of their first fruits, to the temple in Jerusalem and offer it to God there and to celebrate together what God was doing. And so they have these two festivals that work together. The festival of unleavened bread and Passover is the freedom, the rescue out of Egypt and out of slavery and into the freedom of a new life. And then the festival of weeks and, pa and Pentecost 50 days later that celebrates the giving of the law and the beginning of the new life that God wanted to shape them for and, and invite them into. And so it's beautiful how the Christian story follows this story that God had already been writing with his, with his people. And so during the Festival of Unleavened Bread, when, God, when God's people are remembering their emancipation, their freedom, their liberation from Egypt, that's when Jesus dies on the cross and is raised to new life and offering freedom and emancipation and, and forgiveness of sins for the whole world, for all of us. And then 50 days later at Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples in the upper room in Acts and as they're gathered in Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit is poured out in what appears to be tongues of fire and there's a rushing mighty wind. And then they're speaking in tongues as the good news of Jesus spreads to all these other nations. People from other languages that are all gathered in Jerusalem. Many scholars believe that all those different people are gathered in Jerusalem because it was the festival of weeks. It was Pentecost. And they were gathered there to come on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem and present their offerings at the temple. And the disciples were gathered together during this festival, sharing a meal. A festival is a, a feast, and so they eat together. That's part of what you do at festivals, at celebrations, is you eat together. And so they're gathered together in this room, and they're praying, and they're fasting, and they're waiting on God, because this significant thing has happened in Jesus' death and resurrection, and now it's been 50 days, and they've been waiting, and God, what's next for us? And the Holy Spirit comes, and the church is born. It's beautiful that this festival is also a festival of harvest, of first fruits, because Jesus talked about his death and resurrection as being the death of a seed. That He said, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it can't bear harvest. And, and so we talk about Jesus' resurrection. Paul talks about that as the first fruits of the harvest to come when we all too are raised from the dead. But even so, in John 20, Jesus after his resurrection, he appears in the room with them as they're so afraid after Jesus' death. He, he's raised from the dead. He appears in the room, and it says he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to them. But now, 50 days later, the Holy Spirit comes in a different kind of way, in a way that's now not just for the disciples, but for everyone. After Peter's sermon, and he explains what's going on, and people hear it in their own language, it says 3,000 are added to the church that day. 3,000 from one sermon. From that one event as God's Spirit is poured out on them in Jerusalem. This harvest is beginning, and it's the beginning of the harvest, not just of those people gathered in Jerusalem, but of the whole world. And as they learn throughout the rest of the story in Acts, in account after account, the Holy Spirit goes to unexpected people in unexpected places, showing that the Holy Spirit is now available for everyone who comes to Jesus. So the good news for us at Pentecost 
is that the Holy Spirit is not just for them. The Holy Spirit is for us. And the Holy Spirit is God's presence with us, God's gift to us of his own self. And God, through his own self, as his own self, by the Holy Spirit, is available to you and to me. It's a gift of God's love, God's own presence with us all the time. That's the beauty of our story, that it's not just Jesus dead and resurrected and we have this great hope for the future, but God is way off somewhere else and we've got to keep it all together until he comes back. No, no, it's way better than that. God is with us here in the middle of it, walking alongside us, helping us as we grow and learn and find freedom and healing, and reconciliation and forgiveness and hope. He's here in the middle of it with you and with me. There's some debate in the church about how or when we receive the Holy Spirit. I like to keep it simple. God loves you like crazy. Ask him. And if you need the church to surround you, ask and we'll gather and we'll help you. We'll, the, the New Testament has stories of, of laying on hands and praying for people to receive the Holy Spirit. And maybe in a pandemic, we have to be careful about the laying on of hands, but we can pray for each other. We can ask God and he sends the Holy Spirit. It's his gift to us. He loves you. He wants to be with you. He wants you to know that he is with you. Here's some of the roles that the Holy Spirit has that you can find in scripture. The Holy Spirit is our companion. It's, he's God with us, God's presence with us all the time. We aren't alone. He's with us in every situation, every scenario. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit reveals God's will to us. The Spirit teaches us what God wants us to do and how we apply that to our lives. As we read the Bible, we can read it with an ear to hear, God, what are you saying to me through this? And he can speak to us, often in surprising and unexpected kind of ways, as God helps us by the Holy Spirit understand his word and speak to us through his word. In fact, we can't accurately understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us understanding. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads us into truth. Jesus said he is the spirit of truth. And the Holy Spirit is our guide. He leads us into wisdom, not just truth and understanding of what God is saying, but also the wisdom of how to apply it in our lives. Not just right knowledge, but right living. He guides us. We can ask him when we're struggling with a decision or a question. He can give us perspective, give us advice, help us know the best way to live. The Spirit is our counselor. The Spirit is the one who leads us into healing and freedom. And often healing and freedom for us means we've got to face the darkness inside of us. We've got to face up to that side of us that wants to rebel, that side of us that struggles against God's ways, that side of us that wants to be self-centered. Each one of us knows deep down there's some darkness that has to be wrestled with. And the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us with that. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the courage to face that part of ourselves, to confess the sin, to receive the healing and the forgiveness and the freedom that God wants to give us. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us of sin and brings us to the Father for reconciliation. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us to be reconciled with one another. He's our counselor. And the Holy Spirit is our advocate. There's scriptures that talk about when we don't have the words to pray, the Holy Spirit is praying for us. The Holy Spirit is advocating for us, praying on our behalf to God often with, with words and groans that we don't even understand, this scripture says. So we can take great comfort in that, that the Holy Spirit is helping us pray. And finally, the Holy Spirit is our power. And I, I don't mean finally like this is an exhaustive list. There's probably all kinds of more stuff you can find in the Bible about the roles of the Holy Spirit. But these are a few that came to mind for me as I was reading these scriptures and thinking about it. But the Holy Spirit equips us with gifts and abilities to do the ministry that he gives us to do. Because the gift of the Spirit is not just about us. It's not just for the building of the church, but it's also for witness in the world. Jesus talks about that in John in the passage that we heard read. And we see that 
lived out in Acts as Peter begins to preach to the people and explain to them what's going on. The Spirit empowers us for witness in the world, witness through the way that we live, the freedom and the healing we experience in our lives, and the love and the forgiveness that we're able to offer to others, but also through the words of our witness, the words of our testimony as we begin to share what God is doing in our lives and in our hearts with others. All of these, all of these things invite us into a relationship with God, a real relationship with God where God is with us and we can talk with him. The gift of the Spirit at Pentecost means that God is really present with us all the time. In every situation, there's nowhere you can go, the psalmist says, to flee from your spirit. Wherever you go, God is there with you. He's ready and willing to help you with everything. So this means that when you pray, when you want to be in relationship with God, you don't have to go to a church building or some particularly holy place. Although places can help us, they can help our bodies and our minds Um, focus. But you don't have to go to a specific place to connect with God. God is with you wherever you are. You don't have to adopt a certain posture to connect with God. You can pray kneeling by your bed or dancing in a field or however you want. We're all different. We all connect with God in different ways. Listening to a song, reading a book, talking with a friend, God speaks to us in all sorts of ways, and we can talk with him in all kinds of situations. You don't need a specific place, you don't need a specific posture, and you don't need specific words. Fancy, highfalutin religious language doesn't help you connect with God any better than just a normal, cried out, help. God wants you to be honest with him. It's a relationship. Just talk to him in normal language. Talk to him in whatever way helps you articulate what you're feeling. You don't need fancy words. The Spirit is with us every day, every moment, in every situation. God is present with you, in you, ready and willing to work through you and in you in his unforced rhythms of grace and love. So that means that in the middle of this pandemic, even though we're isolated from one another, we are still united by the Spirit. We are still the church. Even though we can't experience the stuff that normally is part of our church experience that bonds us together, we are still one in Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are not alone. Even if you might be alone at home, you are never truly alone. You are connected with all of us by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God is with you there. So the question becomes then, how do we become more attentive to the Spirit of God? How do I become more aware of the Spirit of God with me all the time? One of the ways that the church has talked about this through the the years and, and wrestled with this is through what we call the practicing the presence of God or praying without ceasing. There's a scripture in the New Testament that tells us to pray without ceasing. It's this idea of this ongoing, constant relationship with God. And there's a few different ways that the church has tried to do that through the years, different ways that people have developed. One is a simple tool called a breath prayer, where you say a simple phrase like, Jesus, have mercy on me, and you breathe it in and you breathe it out. So you might say, as you breathe in, Jesus, and as you breathe out, have mercy on me. Or it could be anything you want, some phrase that's meaningful for you. And you breathe it in, you breathe it out, and you repeat it over and over again until it becomes almost an unconscious thing, just as unconscious as breathing. But you're constantly communing and being aware of God's Spirit with you. I have have a Catholic friend who told me that for him, the praying the rosary is a similar kind of practice, that many of the prayers are repetitive and and it's it's intended in his explanation, it's intended to be something that becomes that kind of unconscious prayer. That it's not necessarily about the specific words you're saying so much as it is about entering into God's presence there with you and communing with God in that moment. I think that's incredibly beautiful. We can pray without ceasing in that kind of way. You can talk with God anywhere, out loud, in your mind, silently, while you're at work, all the time. There's a a little book by Brother Lawrence, who is a a monk who discovered this and learned to pray while he's doing menial chores throughout the day. 
It's called The Practice of the Presence of God. It's really very tiny. If you like to read that, I have it available for you to borrow. Another practice that you can use is to just stop at moments throughout the day. Use the acronym STAR. This is a new one that I learned recently. And so if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling stressed out, if you're feeling like you just need to take a moment, then you stop. That's the S. Stop what you're doing. The T is take a breath. Slow down your heart. Be attentive to God in that place. And then the A is to appreciate Jesus. Connect with Jesus through praise and thanksgiving. Be, focus your mind on things that you're thankful for and express that in appreciation to Jesus. And then the R is to respond, to respond with obedience to what God reveals to you. So star, if you're stressed out, if you're overwhelmed, stop, take a breath, appreciate Jesus, and respond to what he shows you. Another practice that the church has used through the years is called the daily office. This comes out of a Jewish tradition of having set times for prayer throughout the day. And the early church adopted those times and expanded on them. And so there are set times through the day where they would stop what they were doing, read some scriptures together, worship Jesus together, maybe sing a song, say some prayers. And as they're set throughout the day, every two or three hours you're stopping and doing this, it becomes a constant rhythm, a flow year after year, decade after decade, where your life is this constant rhythm of communing with God. And it begins to shape you over time. Many people more recently um, in thinking about the daily office have, div have shortened the number of hours instead of having multiple ones throughout the day and in the middle of the night um, to morning prayer, maybe a noon prayer, evening prayer. Some people add uh, complaint, com compline or vespers, um, which is kind of just prayer before you go to bed. You can have as many or as little as you want, but the point is to have these moments when you intentionally connect with Jesus. Another practice that developed out of that, and it's been part of our evangelical Protestant tradition, even though it's only relatively 100 years old, is the practice of a daily quiet time. And so that's typically a time, often in the morning, where you read a scripture and maybe a devotional thought and spend some time in prayer. All these practices can be helpful to help you practice being aware of God's presence throughout the day and making space in your day to connect with Jesus and be mindful of God's presence. Be mindful that the Holy Spirit is there in that moment with you. Don't think about this as more stuff that you have to do. It's all about relationship with Jesus, about walking in the power of the Spirit, in the comfort of the Spirit, in the assurance of the Spirit, the companionship of the Spirit, of God with you all the time. And these practices are ways that can be helpful. Do what's helpful. Maybe challenge yourself to stretch a little bit, try something new, but don't let it become a religious duty. Don't let it become something that is a checklist that you mark off that you did your thing for the day and then you move on. No, let it be something that builds in you a continual awareness of God with you and you with God. Finally, in Philippians, Paul writes, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In every situation, bring your request to God. He's with you. He loves you. Happy Pentecost.